Mic. Am I on? Am I on now? Okay, good. Okay. And recording. Okay. They, Mike, uh, Marty told me we're going online with this one. So in a open with a word of prayer reminds me that a couple of weeks ago, Rich opened his sermon, or at least mentioned, Psalm 19.14, and I thought that would be a really appropriate opening for the prayer for this. It's uh, David wrote, May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. So, Father God, like David, I pray that through this presentation, you, your Son, and your Holy Spirit will be honored and glorified. Thank you, Father, for bringing me to this fellowship of Christ-following men. What a blessing they are and have been to me. I pray that each one here today will be blessed by this presentation and that they will be good Bereans and offer corrections and guidance should I err. And more important, in those cases, help me to be teachable. Amen. As a note, every verse that's mentioned in the presentation today uh, is not on the handouts, although most of the important ones are on uh, page two and th two, I think, the back of the first page. Uh, however, most of the relevant verses are on that page two, and that's where you'll find them. So let me see if my clicker works. And we'll go to the first chart, and that's the danger. I've got the computer here, so I don't have to be turning around to see if it worked. <laughs> so it's the introduction to hell, and notice the second subtitle is the danger of rejecting the gospel. And that's really the uh, important part of this presentation. So you all know the banter that starts with, well, I've got good news and bad news. Well, I'm regret to inform you that most of this presentation is about the bad news. However, there are a few places uh, that are mentioned the good news, and that's when we talk about the gospel, and especially at the end. So if you hold your patience till the last presentation, there's some really, really good news that wraps this up. Well, there are two easy-to-memorize verses that I'm sure everyone here uh, understands and has memorized, and the first one's Romans 3.23, which says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Paul <coughs> mentioned all, not just uh, a few, but all. And that includes all of us here, and that's the bad news. And the worst news is Romans 6.23, which says that the penalty for that bad news, for that sin, is death. But Paul also is pretty good. He finished 623 with some good news, which said that God would uh, take care of us in the end. So I could literally stop there with the front end of this thing because that tells, sort of summarizes what we're going to be talking about today, get right into the meat of it. But there's not much detail there. And so what we'll be presenting here is a lot of the details. Now, a lot of people embrace the good news as soon as they hear it and uh, recognize it, but there are a lot of different reactions when people first hear it. There's indifference, skepticism, enthusiasm, curiosity, confusion, contradiction, hostility, but more importantly, there's sincere repentance and acceptance. Now, Paul presented the gospel in almost every one of his letters. I would say with the possible exception of Philemon, but even there, he gives an example of the good news, the forgiveness that Philemon is encouraged to give his servant, his runaway servant, Onesimus. Uh, <clears throat> but I think Paul also had the people in this, these ones who entered, accepted the gospel with sincere repentance and acceptance, when in chapter 10 he wrote, how then will they call on him whom they have not heard, or believed, and how will they believe on him whom they've not heard, and how will they hear without a preacher? And I suspect that all of you here 
or in that group that is called on Christ and believes. But if not, uh, you definitely need to pay attention to the rest of the presentation. This presentation is meant to encourage, and it meant to encourage you to use it, what you learn here, to reach those who have not heard, but for some reason have not called on Christ as Lord and Savior. And for those that you meet who need a little, an election, a little extra encouragement, or maybe even a threat. Now about those who think they're saved, but who are not in reality, they're on their way to hell. You know some of these too. They're ones that have been fooled by, uh, deceived by some glib TV preacher. They embrace what they think is the good news. And then there are the cults, of course, who have led many to believe that they are walking in the light, but aren't. Still others hear the good news, but fail to recognize its importance. They're just too busy with life. And then there are the ones who hear the good news, buy a Bible, join a church, and attend every Sunday and every opportunity to be at the church. And they think they've accepted it, but not always. But most devastating are those that we know and love, usually someone in our family, a child, a sibling, a grandchild, a mother, father. These are people who've heard the good news and know it. They've even studied it, but for some reason have rejected it. Some pain has entered their life that caused them to quit believing in God. Well, Jesus addressed all of these people in Matthew 13, but the uh, four Gospels are all about the good news. And now Romans 3.23 and 6.23 tell why the good news is necessary. And I'm confident that most, if not all of you here, know what the Gospel is, but for clarity, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it because it sets the context for the rest of the presentation. I mentioned that Paul included the good news in almost every one of his letters. Here are just a few examples. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's power for salvation. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteousness by faith will live. Now, I underline those last few words there because he's quoting the Old Testament. So even in the Old Testament, the need for righteousness was emphasized. Paul continues the gospel theme all through Romans. In chapter 10, he tells us, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he continued this in 1 Corinthians, for he said, I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And to the Ephesians he wrote what is my favorite verse, the one that I have asked be engraved on my marker if anybody makes one when the time comes. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we all know what the good news is. We know what the gospel is, that Jesus died for our sins, that salvation is a gift, and that we have no part in our own salvation. But don't think that the verses I put up on the screen are the only verses that explicitly use the word translated as gospel. It appears over 90 times in the New Testament, in most English translations anyway. For instance, it is referred to as the word became flesh in the first chapter of John. And in Romans 1, Paul said the gospel is the power of God for salvation. In Ephesians 1, he said the good news is that God has blessed us in Christ. So the good news is that because of the cross of Christ, we can be saved from hell. We can avoid it. So now we're going to start getting into the introduction to hell. But first, I want to take a short trip down memory lane. Now, I'm sort of an old guy, as a few of you, not all of you are. 
But in my lifetime, I've seen an amazing array of new things. Computers, television, jet planes, the internet. You realize that the first internet service provider was only about 30 years ago? I mean, that's how recent the internet is. And don't forget spaceships to the moon. Not to mention the power of this little gadget here. Everybody's got one now, except Keith, I guess. You don't have one, do you? <laughs> but there's more power in this thing here than, speaking of going to the moon, there's more power in this little thing, more computing power than there was in the Apollo spacecraft and the lunar lander combined. So we've come a long way. But there's also... Um, the inter uh, artificial intelligence, which has essentially exploded on the scene just recently. It seems that every website, like Amazon and Costco even, and everything you go, they've added an AI bot to help you decide how to spend your money. Well, in my lifetime, I've also seen a lot of things disappear, like glass Coke bottles. Remember those? Dial telephones. I mean, I've got one that I punch buttons on a piece of glass. They aren't even real buttons. How about shaving mugs? Anybody here still use a shaving mug? No, no nobody still uses. Yeah, see, they, I used to use one of those. How about th those milk bottles with cardboard stoppers in them? Do you remember those? I was the oldest in my family, and one of my jobs was on milk delivery day to go out and pick up the three or four. I'm the oldest of nine, so there were a lot of milk bottles out there. So anyway, um, that was one of my jobs to bring those in. Oh, by the way, did you remember the, I guess, collection raids that started as a result of those little cardboard stoppers? They were called POGs. This started back in the 90s. A, this is a collection of POGs that uh, I got for the Kingdom in Seattle. It no longer exists, but when they built it, they, uh, uh, passed it, they passed these out. And every church, business, club, all had pogs. That was a sort of a common thing that they all had. Well, they went out of business just a few years after the rage started. A Canadian company that made them, quit making them, went out of business. Well, but the rage died then. So, and just a few years ago, uh, we're talking about things that have disappeared. Just a few years ago, in 2004, the Oldsmobile disappeared, bit the dust. We realized that that is one of America's oldest cars. It was first hit the road in 1897. And then, five years later, in 2009, the Pontiac went away. And this one really hit me hard. My graduation present to myself was a brand new ordered from the factory 1966 GTO. So I really mourned the passing of that. <laughs> My friend Dave had one too. I also regret that I don't still have that Pontiac because I think I paid $3,000 for it and it's probably now worth about 80000 or so if it's still around. But none of the disappearances I just mentioned are as amazing as the disappearance of hell. Unfortunately, this disappearance was not among the general population. It seems to have disappeared primarily from the pews and pulpits of many of our churches. I can't remember the last time I heard a pul pulpit pounding fire and brimstone sermon warning men and women that there is a hell and unless they're saved, they're destined for it. Have any of you noticed that disappearance? Billy Graham did. He famously said, if we had more hell in the pulpit, we'd have less hell in the pew. <coughs> Next came a series of famous Christian Charlies. Uh, I didn't realize that so many of our well-known pastors and men of faith were Charlies. But Charles Ryle, he saw it his responsibility to tell the lost about hell. He said, if I never spoke of hell, I should think I had kept back something that was profitable, and that I should look on myself as an accomplice of the devil. Then there was Charles Finney, who you may recall was the well-known revivalist of the Second Great Awakening, which took place in the early 1800s. He chastised the sleepy and active pew-sitters who failed to reach out to a friend or relative 
that they thought was lost. He said, when sinners are careless and stupid and sinking into hell all unconcerned, it is time that the church should bestir themselves. It is much a duty of the church to awake as it is for the firemen to awake when a fire breaks out in a great city. Even the famous Charles Spurgeon had a comment on our obligation to the lost. He said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap over to hell over our bodies and let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. But Charles Ryle also recognized that ultimately those who end up in hell, as sad as it is, have no one to blame but themselves. He said, the saddest road to hell is the one that runs under the pulpit, past the Bible, and through the middle of warnings and invitations. Well, it's a testimony to our leadership here at New Hope that they supported this topic being released, uh, presented. When I asked Pastor Rich a few weeks ago if he believed that hell should be preached from the pulpit, <clears throat> his answer was unequivocally yes, and that he had done so. Well, I first presented this topic back in 2005 at my previous church, and again in 2010. Polls at that time revealed that the, although 69% of Americans believed in hell, only 32% saw it as a place of torment. I haven't figured out that disconnect yet. Well, a more recent Pew Research pool and poll in 2021 said the number had dropped to 62%. But it was even worse in England, where a 21, 2021 Guardian poll said it had down to 28% that believed in hell. This chart is from a May of this year. It's just a recent poll. It's Gallup. And though the trend for all things biblical is down, hell is only slightly better than the one hell was credited for. Hell was 59%. Satan was 58%. So, get your pencils out. Time to fill in the first set of blanks. The summary of everything you just heard is, in the last 50 years, hell has all but disappeared from our pews and pulpits. I sort of use the carrot and the stick analogy. If the gospel is the carrot, the stick is hell. Well, in many ways, this disappearance of hell is consistent with the increasing disintegration in society. A disintegration that is literally taking place right before our eyes. I'm sure every one of you here has noticed it. I'm not going to list any of the perversions and degradations I could, since you are all aware of them. They're just too gruesome to mention. I, sometimes to see what things are being taught in schools, I just weep. Well, hell sure hasn't disappeared from the culture or, the, or our vocabulary, has it? Have you noticed how many TV shows and movies have a theme based on hell or on demons? One of the most popular TV series back around the turn of the century is called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I don't know if anybody remembers even hearing of it, but it was very popular. It was a, fairy, a, f a series that featured demons as well as vampires. And then in 2004, a major movie based on the comic book Hellboy grossed over $60 million in its first few weeks. That's over $100 million in today's inflated dollars. The sequel, Hellboy 2, did even better when it was released in 2006. Now the main character, oh, I mentioned uh, this, this gets even worse. Disney recently released an animated series called Little Demon. You ever heard, anybody hear of that one? Not a, not a hand. Little Demon. It was an animated cartoon series and released on TV. And they, it was called Little Demon. It featured images of hell, demons, and Satan. Now, here are some of the kickers in it. The main character is a 13 year old girl who is presented as, believe it or not, the Antichrist. And she is a result of an affair between her mother and, guess who? Satan. Well, the good news here is that a group of mothers called One Million Moms raised a ruckus about it, and it was not renewed for a second season. 
But can you imagine Disney releasing that movie? It just blew my mind. Well, anyway, the congruence between the disappearance from the pulpits and the rise in the culture is that both downplay the significance and the reality of hell. Back when I was a kid, we learned that there were bad words, four-letter words, we called them, and that using them, especially in the wrong place, meant an introduction to Grandma's lye soap, or at least her bar of ivory soap. Hell was one of those four-letter words, so we didn't use it in polite company, but we used an aphorism to refer to it. I remember even at age 16 referring to it one day as H-E double hockey sticks. We knew it was a bad place, we didn't want to be there, that it was eternal fire, that the devil was there, and that in addition to the flames, we had to endure being poked and prodded by his demons with their pitchforks. And although 12 years in Catholic schools gave me a slightly expanded understanding of hell, I was also introduced to some, quote, options that simply aren't in Scripture. That's subject for another presentation, I guess. But today, our vocabulary and our culture are full of casual references to hell, but in such a way that its true implications are not only lost, but ignored through overuse and misuse. Here's a couple of favor, famous examples. The first was by President Harry Truman during the 1949 presidential campaign. He was at a rally and he was railing and preaching against those rascally Republicans when a supporter in the crowd jumped up and pointed and said, give them hell, Harry. Without skipping a beat, Truman paused, without, did not pause, and said, I don't give them hell, I just tell the truth about them, and they think it's hell. And he got a few laughs about that. But a few years earlier, then politician, then president, Calvin Coolidge, who was vice president at this time, was presiding over the Senate. And a heated argument broke out on the Senate floor between a couple of senators. Right at the height of it, one of them pointed at the other one and said, go to hell. Well, the offended senator looked up at Cal up on his elevated podium and said, help. And Cal held up a manual <laughs> and said, Senator, I just reviewed the Senate rules and you don't have to go. <laughs> so, I mean, witty rejoinders like these are pretty good and funny and humorous. But comments like these are the, ca the mildest kind of casual misuse I'm referring to because people tend to lose sight of the deadly serious implications and the reality of hell. And it gets worse than jocularity. Every day you hear somebody claim that they went through hell for something. And doesn't a painful injury hurt like hell? Impossibilities will occur when? When hell freezes over, right? And certainties will occur sure as hell. And an angry person is mad as hell. And of course, comments about the heat in Arizona are some version of it's hot as hell. But even this cartoon plays into the deception. So what's the message? Through misuse and abuse in culture and language, hell has become a jocular and meaningless part of everyday conversation. Well, not everybody has always treated hell so casually. A little over 282 years ago, that what is probably the most famous fire and brimstone sermon in history was preached in Enfield, Connecticut. In July of 1741, in the midst of the Great Awakening, Pastor Jonathan Edwards preached for the first time his sinners in the hands of an angry God sermon. Actually, it was the second time. Correct that. It's one that every man, woman, and child, saved or not, should hear, but especially those who are lost. In this powerful sermon, Jonathan Edwards paints a picture of sinners walking across a fiery pit on rotten planks or hanging by a thread over that same pit. 
He makes it clear that fallen man is destined for hell and that one day only his turning to Jesus can that destiny be avoided. It's reported that he had to stop several times during the sermon because of the wailing and crying and moaning at the, at the strength of his message. Read along with me this brief excerpt from that sermon. O sinner, consider the fearful danger that you're in. It's a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of the fire of wrath, that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread over that same fire, and the flames of wrath flashing about it, and at every moment threatening to singe it and burn it asunder. And here's the important part. You have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, nothing to keep off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing that you have ever done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. If you've never heard or read this sermon, there are links to a downloaded PDF file on page two of the handout. There's also a link to a YouTube version. Now, it turns out on YouTube there are about 10 or 15 different men reading the sermon, pastors, preachers. One of them even dresses up like a 17th century or 16th, 18th century pastor. Either or both of these links may be handy if you have an opportunity to relate to a hell-bound friend or relative. By the way, the last link on page two, at the bottom of the page, is for those of you who want to do a little additional reading. It's called The Tragic Consequences of Dis Mis Disbelief. There's a link to it on the bottom of the page. It's, uh, uh, I think it is, I hope it is. <laughs> it's a study by Pastor Stephen Cole, and it's based on Numbers 14, 11 through 15. I had just mentioned his name because until December of 2018, he pastored a church not too far from here in, Falls, in Flagstaff. He now writes for um, uh, Bible.org. It's interesting that although Edwards presented several terrifying images of the horrors of hell, Nowhere in this sermon does he present what we call or defend the doctrine of hell, the traditional doctrine. He didn't have to. The people of the Great Awakening understood it. It was taught in their home schools. And that's what the rest of this presentation is about, the traditional view. And there are two parts of this view, and you've heard both of them at least once so far. First, hell is the result of unrepentant sin and the necessity of being born again. So the traditional view of hell is that people go there because of unrepentant sin and not being born again. People go to hell and there they suffer everlasting torment. Well, if the modern evangelical church has a demonstrated weakness, it's a failure to preach about hell. Now, it turns out in the scripture, we're taught, told to preach both to feed the sheep that's those of us who go out and work, but we're also told that we have to reach out to the lost. Those are both mandates that the church has, but the modern church tends to preach, spend more time preaching on teaching the sheep, us. I'm not sure I agree with that particular emphasis. I think both should be emphasized. I, for one, would like to see hear Edward's sermon preach word for word every now and then. Those of you familiar with it know how powerful and scary that it is. Those not in Christ need to know that hell is real and that they're all bound for it, that only in Christ will they avoid its eternal pain. Now, many of you know that I was raised Catholic. The Catholic Church has a penitence prayer called the Act of Contrition where the sinner says, Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee. And I detest of all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. But most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. Well, 
we learned this in the first grade. And as a little boy, I would have rewritten the second part to repeat seven words out of the first part. But most of all, I dread the pains of hells. Because that's what really caught my attention in this prayer. It was hell that I was afraid of. It scared me. So back in 2005, when I was asked to prepare a presentation on class on hell, I already had some pretty definite views about hell in mind. But once I started my study, I found that the subject was a little more complex than I originally thought. So much so that I was reminded of a particularly challenging two-part bonus question that I had on a physics quiz in college. Part one was describe the universe in 500 words or less, which I thought was pretty challenging, but part two was even worse. It said give two examples. Well, I thought, what I found out was when I started studying hell that it was complicated like these two questions. Well, that complexity comes about because of three major reasons. First, for the words in scripture that had been translated as hell, and Marty alluded to this part when he was speaking. Second is the apparent reasons given for the person going to hell. And third was the nature and the eternality of the torment of hell. So I'm just going to focus on three major parts in the rest of this presentation. First one is that hell is real, that unrepentant and unsaved sinners go to hell, and that suffering in hell is intense and eternal. So, the words in Scripture that have been translated as hell, the apparent reasons forgiven for going to hell, and here we are. Hell is real. Well, the doctrine of hell is probably the one component of Christian teaching that brings a tinge of fear to the heart of every man, woman, and child, especially those that are not saved, but who still think they're might be a hell. I've never bet, in, met anybody that's particularly uh, comfortable with the idea of hell, much less the reality. The mere thought of anybody, somebody, spending an eternity suffering in hell is repugnant to our most basic sense of human justice. Key phrase there, human justice. Some have their very faith in God strained by the idea of hell. How is it, they ask, that a loving and merciful God will send any of his creatures whom he claims to love to hell, to eternal suffering? Never mind for now that that's the wrong question. But that very question, to some extent, helps explain Christian universalism, a small but long-lived belief that claims that 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 teaches that all mankind will be saved. This is good and acceptable in the sight of the Lord, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I have wondered if this abhorrence of eternal damnation may have had some influence on the development of the doctrine of purgatory in the Catholic Church. I don't know that. I tried to research it, couldn't find any evidence. It's just something I wondered about. However, the overwhelming majority of current, historical, current and historical Christian theologians affirm the traditional reality of hell in its existence, its duration, and its torments, not because they like it, but because that through their most intense study, they find no alternative in Scripture. So filling out the blanks, historical and contemporary Christian theologians affirm the traditional doctrine of hell in its existence, its duration, and in its torments. So does everybody know that hell is real? Well, they ought to. For although Romans 1.20 tells us that God reveals himself in his creation, it is preceded by verses 18 and 19, where he tells us that man is also aware of God's wrath against sin. He says right at the end of verse, 20, verse 18, for God made it evident to them. Could it be more obvious that God has implanted an awareness of mankind that unrighteousness and ungodly living 
will incur his wrath. The reason I point this out is that almost every major culture and religion throughout recorded history has had some concept of a place of punishment in the afterlife. In a 1993 paper entitled The Formation of Hell, a Cornell history professor named Alan Bernstein described early Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greek, and other pagan cultures <clears throat> that describe an afterlife that includes rewards and punishments based on one's behavior during life. By the way, he's no longer at Cornell. He's a professor of history at the University of Arizona. And he's translated that paper into a textbook now, which you can buy for $60 at any bookstore if you want. But you don't have to because I provided a link in your handout. It's under the, I think it's right at the end of the fill in the blanks. And it's a leaderu.com link. There you can read his original paper about the formation of hell. But interestingly, talking about these cultures, these religions in ancient cultures, with one exception, the punishment in those earlier societies was not eternal. Each provided what amounts to an escape clause. Typically, after some period of cleansing, purifying, roasting, or refreshing, the sinner is allowed to enter paradise, be annihilated, or enters the next cycle, whatever that is. I don't know what that is. <clears throat> A significant exception is the Greek Tartarus, one of their words for hell. It featured prominently in many of Plato's writings. But even the Greeks could not envision only two options in the afterlife. Eternal suffering is the lowest of four possible destinations. The lowest level, however, did get a mention in Scripture. Second Peter, Peter in his second letter, tells us that Tartarus is the abode of the fallen angels. And although Peter was obviously drawing on the imagery that his Greek-speaking audience could relate to, it resonates with the image of the lake of fire used elsewhere for the destination of the fallen angels, both in the eternality and the intensity of the suffering. Finally, our English word hell is based on, a, it has a root in an Anglo-Saxon word also pronounced hell, but with just one L. And it means concealed. And some sources also add the fact that if you add E-L to the end, you get Helen. And that's because Helen is the name of the being who presides over hell. Well, in Norse mythology, though, hell was the abode of the, boat of the wicked dead and was contrasted with Valhalla, where the good went after death. Well, I don't want to spend any more time on other cultures. I want to get on with this because Orthodox Christianity is unique in presenting an afterlife with only two options, one of which is eternal suffering. I recognize that there are a lot of smaller cultures which have more than two or only have two, but I was just talking about major historical cultures. So then how do we know that hell is real? Existence for, uh, evidence for the existence of hell as a real place is almost totally in the New Testament. In fact, a casual overview of the Old Testament might lead one to believe that the ancient Hebrews had only a vague concept of hell as we understand it today, or at best, only a developing awareness of a hell of punishment. And I see somebody here who has some experience with this. <laughs> the vagueness is perhaps behind the fact that even present-day Judaism has no firm universal doctrinal position teaching eternal punishment. Now, like Christianity and Judaism, there are lots of different uh, subsections, I guess you'd say. But this one I found, as, uh, one I found was pretty interesting. The, in this particular one, the longest one can be in hell if it exists at all, according to one rabbinical teaching, is 12 months. And I found that on a website called myjewishlearning.com. So if you want to look it up, you can find it out. Well, in any case, the Old Testament word most often associated with hell is shoal, 
This association is mainly due to the King James consistent translation as the Greek word Hades, which is then translated in English to hell. Unfortunately, that string of translations just doesn't hold up to close scrutiny. The word Sheol simply denotes a cave or a place under the earth. It's used 65 times at least in the Old Testament and is variously presented as the congregation of the dead in Proverbs and the abode of the wicked in Numbers and Job and several places of Psalms. But it's also translated in Psalms as the abode of the good. In Job 10, it's called the dark, and in Job 11, the deep. And finally, in Job 17, we're told that it has bars on it like a jail cell. And in Numbers 16 and Ezekiel 31, we find that the dead go down to it, but there's no designation as the condition of those who go down to it. Well, the 72 Hebrew scholars who translated the Septuagint, they didn't help much either. They simply uh, translated each occurrence of the Greek word Hades, uh, translated each occurrence of Sheol to the Greek word Hades, which means about the same thing, the abode of the dead. So the Sheol of the Old Testament is definitely not the hell of the New Testament. But there's no shortage of grim Old Testament imagery of what awaits those who are outside of God's will. A mild ver reference to this is Daniel's end time description in chapter 12, verse 2, where he wrote, The multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting com contempt. But in Proverbs, it gets a little stronger. Be sure of this, the wicked will not go unpunished, but those who are righteous will go free. The most telling is Isaiah's description of what goes on when the new heaven and the new earth have been created. Take a look here at Isaiah 6, through 24, especially 24. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. Take note of the tense that Isaiah used here. It'll come up again in just a minute. Here, Isaiah is seeing the far distant future when God has just created the new heavens and the new earth. And he sees the saved worshiping God on high, and he sees the lost continuously being eaten by undying maggots and burned by an unquenchable fire. So I ask again, just how do we know that hell is real? Well, is the word of Christ Jesus good enough? I think it is. You probably all agree. In Luke 16, Jesus tells the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Now remember, Jesus was still living in Old Testament times. So as he relates this story, he uses Old Testament imagery and understanding. Just because contemporary theologians disagree about whether Jesus is telling a record of a historical event or just a parable to make a point, doesn't change the fact that Jesus is teaching that immediately after death, saints and sinners go to two different places, and that one of them, a place of torment and suffering. Now, clearly, it was not the physical bodies of either Lazarus or the rich man that were playing out this scene. Both of those, both of those bodies were rotting in some grave somewhere. So we know that it was their souls or spirits that were experiencing succor or torment, as the case may have been. So, filling in some more blanks, in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, Jesus clearly tells us that after death, the soul of the righteous goes to paradise, and that of the right, unrighteous to hell. But most often, when Jesus taught about hell, he used the Hebrew word Gehenna a name with horrendous and graphic significance to those he taught. By the way, God considers being righteous and righteousness the catch-all requirement for being saved. To be righteous before God is the only criteria for salvation, and we only become righteous when we repent of our sin and accept the gift won by Christ on the cross. 
Now Gehenna was also known as the Valley of the Son of Hinnon, and also called Topheth. And it lies on the south side of Jerusalem, as you can see in this image from an old book that I came across. It was a deep, narrow gorge where all the waste of Jerusalem, and especially the bodies of executed criminals, was dumped and burned. It was said that the fires there burned continuously. But it wasn't just that contemporary image that Jesus evoked when he used Gehenna to describe the suffering and pain of hell. The Israelites were well aware of the despicable history of that same valley. Here Jeremiah tells us that several hundred years earlier when the Israelites had deserted God, the valley of Hinnon was where they sacrificed their own children to Baal. And because they have filled this place with the butt of the innocent and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fires, burn offerings to Baal. So there was an image that Christ was evoking when he mentioned this. He was calling up a gruesome and a terrible image of not only continuous fire, but suffering. Okay, the word Gehenna is used 13 times in the New Testament, 11 of them by Jesus. James uses it in three, in chapter 3, verse 6, and John uses it in Revelation 21, 8. Each use relates to a place that is understood to be not just unpleasant, but horrific. Matthew 10, 28 is a good example. In this chapter, Jesus is commissioning the 12 and giving them their final instructions. In that verse, he says, Do not fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Well, the same goes for the parallel passage in Luke 12. By the way, popular mythology tells us that Satan is the boss in hell. This verse makes it clear that it ain't so. Every, even more clear is Revelation 1.18, where John has just fallen at the feet of Christ, who tells him to, not to fear and then says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Well, Gehenna is the word used for hell by both Matthew and Mark in the pluck out your eye and cut off your hand passages. And in Matthew 23, 33, Jesus asked the brood of vipers, the scribes and the Pharisees, how, will, how they will escape the sentence of hell. But more horrific than these passages that specifically refer to hell by, nail, by name are the passages that describe what happens there. The first is in Mark 9, which is a very, very busy chapter. But in his version of the pluck out your eye and cut off your hand verse, he reads that Jesus quotes Isaiah, the one we just referred to, 66, 24. He says, the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Now, technically, Jesus is not quoting. This is not a quote. It's a paraphrase. Because in it, Jesus confirming Isaiah's prophecy, he is saying, oh, yes, hell is real. But why is it an accurate quote? Why is it just a paraphrase? Well, when Isaiah was speaking of the future, the far distant future, Jesus is speaking of it as the present and eternity. Isaiah's original said, where the worm will not die and the fire will not be quenched. And Jesus is saying, they, eat, they do in do eat them and do not die. So neither the worms of corruption nor the unquenchable fire consumes the sinner. The sinner is continuously and horrendously aware of the pain caused by both forever. Now next, in Matthew 3, John the Baptist sees Israel's relig religious leaders approaching. And after calling them a brood of vipers, he warns them that the axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He continues in verse 12 by comparing them to the farmer's chaff. He says his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. Finally, referring again to the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, that leaves no doubt that fire is real, that hell is real, 
and the final destination of the unrepentant sinner who are not born again. Skip down to verse 14. Then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So let's wrap it up here. From John the Baptist to John the Revelator, the Bible testifies to the reality of hell. There should be no doubt among Christians that hell is real. And that wraps up part one and then segues into part two where we talk about the unrepentant sinners who have not accepted Christ as Savior. Now, it will be helpful if sometime during the coming week you find time to watch or listen to Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of a God, Angry God because and links are on page two of the handout. The reason is that some of the questions on the little small handout sheet might refer, that might be a good reference. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for these men who were here this morning to hear this presentation. They all probably have a friend or a relative that's bound for hell, some closer than others. We pray that you will equip them, Lord, and help them with this presentation to be the stick if that's necessary because the carrot is not working. In any case, Father, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to aid in these conversions. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, guys, uh, Ed's made us up some questions. If we remember your groups, we had a group meeting back in the arc room. The group was meeting over here.